Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multi-family mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? J-Love, how we doing, bro? Always making it happen, big man. Today, we have a special edition of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast. We're about to take a deep dive into the 28 questions you should ask your broker about a potential market. Sounds like Gino all day over here. G busy, ready for Dude, this? Dude, love this, love this stuff. Yeah, come bring the pain. As Let's you say. go. Making it happen. Bro. Let's go. So, you got your broker's ear. First question you're going to ask him: What is the job growth, Gino? What are you looking for here? What do you what do you, what do you want to know about the job growth? Why is this such a crucial question? Let's set the stage, my friend, real quick. You're looking at a market. It could be your market. It could be 3,000 miles away. It's the same thing. These questions are all vital. You need to know the answers to these questions before you can even start thinking about making offers, thinking about going in into a market. Once you like these questions, you like these answers, the next step is jump on a plane. I'm doing that Monday. I'm going to Cleveland. I got some of these answers. It's intriguing. Some people say it's emerging. I don't know. I want to get boots on the ground. Google Maps is great. I love getting a little guy, dropping it down, looking around. But there's nothing like going there, getting some Italian food, right? Feeling the vibe there. I don't you know about feel Cleveland. The vibe. I don't but, know about Cleveland. But I'm <laughs> I'm the same. I'm thinking the same way. But you know what? Someone told no, I'm talking about for it's the cranking. Food. I'm saying for the food. Oh, <laughs> well, we're gonna see. I gotta find one. I gotta find one good Italian place, right? We'll I see. mean, come on. There's three hundred thousand people. There's gonna be a couple of good Italian restaurants there. You know, I don't know there's more people but, than that in Knoxville. With... <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the questions, they're really vital questions. You need to know income. We're going to go through all of them, but real quick, you need to know income, expenses, path of progress, job growth. You need to know what's going on in this market. You need to know as if you're living there. And let me tell you, after you answer all these 28 questions, you're probably going to know more about the market than a person who's been there for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in a market, you calm down. You don't know what's going on. You really don't research it because you think you really know it. But do you really know it? Do you know what's going on? Like Jake lives in Knoxville. For example, all of a sudden the path of progress, the South Street Bridge was done. Now, are people moving there? Is UT expanding? If you're not really looking at it and analyzing every three to six months, see where the population is shifting to, the number of households, if you don't stay on top of this stuff, it's going to get by you. And that's how you guys lose money, by not being on top of this stuff. So first thing Jake asked was job growth. I think any real estate investor who knows what they're doing is that's the most important thing to a market is job growth. Not location, location, location. It's jobs 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 and I mean I've been told I've been taught that two percent is what you should strive for year over year job growth um, I mean up here in the Northeast not many jobs being created there are but there's so many people leaving it that the job growth is really not that great up here I can give you an example of Rochester um, I always talk about it because it was my, my haven there cash flow cow up there I mean you can make money cash flowing but there's no job growth there so there's not people going in there so those prices are gonna stay where they are another place that Jake likes to talk about is the Rust Belt the Rust Belt is not growing because there's no job growth there you want places like Reno Nevada where Tesla's going you, um, for instance I'm going to Jacksonville Amazon's creating 1500 jobs in Jacksonville health insurance is going down there we got Dallas Texas. You have Toyotas leaving California. Why? Because their employees can't afford housing in California, not only because of the taxes, but the housing situation. So where they're going, they're taking all those jobs to Dallas, Texas. So this is what you have to look for. You have to look for job growth. And you know, on any article that I wrote on Bigger Pockets, go there. It's going to show you some websites you can use to find job growth. If you want to, just simply type in, for instance, Knoxville job growth or top 10 cities with job growth. Those numbers will pop up, and if you want to start there, you start there. I think it's a great place to start, and it's such a crucial thing because, look, especially unless you're going to do like Section 8 or something like that, you're going to need to go where the jobs are because that's where the progress is going to come from. That's where the growth is going to be. And at the end of the day, you might even want to take it a deeper dive and say, what kind of jobs? What you know? Because you may, like us, we have niche tenants, yes. right? Blue collar retail workers. These are the folks that we like to serve. So there could be, um, you know, some uh, uh, some white collar jobs going on, or you know, something else. But you just want to be a little more specific too to say what kind of jobs are actually going in and what what's the percentage of of your niche tenants. So I think that's a great a great first question. The other thing, let me just finish it off by saying that. 
Um, once you go in, if you want to even look at announcements, if you can find out where cities are announcing jobs before they actually, you know, shovel ready and you know where they're announcing, like Chattanooga years ago that announced that VW plan. If you can get into that market before those jobs are announced and before that demand starts for the housing, can you imagine how one you're one step ahead of the deal? So, you know, look look into that also. Especially if it's already a stable market too and it's just gonna be, you know, icing on the cake. Uh, you're already mm-hmm. getting into something great. So that's that's a great point. Uh, next up is what is the population and what is the household growth? I think this dovetails perfectly with the first one. You know, uh, population, house growth are sort of the similar. Household growth is important for what we do because it tells you the number of households. If it's increasing, the households are the ones who are actually renting from us. Population is also, you know, it's it's a nice barometer to see the health of what's going on in, in the market itself. But if you're seeing the households are ticking up, that's what you want because households are the ones that actually rent from us. Totally. Um, this one is, is, is definitely something we've been looking at a lot. I've been speaking with our bankers, speaking with our brokers a lot. How many new units have been built over the past three years? And even more specifically than that, you want to find out where have the units been built. Uh, for example, in Knoxville, everything's being built downtown around UT. So that's one area that you got to really watch out for because at some point there could be an, an overbuild and what you're going to start seeing is, is rents are going to get pushed down because there's an oversupply. That's one thing you really got to watch out for. Fortunately, in our market, the, the suburbs and the submarkets where we invest, it's, there's, been some, there's been some new developments, but nothing crazy that's going to say, whoa, you got you to watch out. The growth has been coming from downtown for, uh, in, our, in our market at least. Guys, I just wrote an article on Bigger Pockets. Don't want to plug it again, but I did that and I wrote it is multifamily about to crash. And I wrote maybe because I specifically talk about this. I don't know the number in front of me, but there's hundreds of thousands of new units coming online this year and it has been because when the recession came what happened is as the recession comes you're starting to build the building they can't shut the spigot off because it takes a couple of years for the building to start so these guys get caught at the tail end of the recession then they stop building then the recession is dead the recovery starts as the recovery starts there's no building going on and there's that demand going on and once the recovery is going into its next phase into you know the expansion aspect of it Demand starts picking up for building, and now that's what's happening. We're getting so many, so much building going on. And as Jake alluded to, most of the building, believe it or not, is Class A stuff, which yes. we tend to stay away from. We like that. So what's going to happen is you have to be careful. If you've got B assets and you've got a B property trading at, let's say it's it's renting for nine hundred bucks a month, all of a sudden an A property opens up ten minutes down the street from you, and they're charging twelve hundred a month. Those tenants might should leave ship and go to the new property because the A property is going to have the cafe. It's going to have you know all the amenities. The pool, the you know, the clubhouse. Sounds like Gino's house. You have to be careful what's coming on and where it's coming on. (laughs) So, I think I read the most. This has been the um, the most units built in the U.S. since 1978. Okay, Jake. You know why that's the case. Also, this is the the lowest in home ownership in the last 50 years. So it all dovetails all together. So we've got less people owning houses, more millennials renting, more baby boomers every seven seconds is a 60 year old in this country. All those demographics all is happening right now. So that's one of the things that I don't know if multifamily has hit its you know, they hit the crest yet or not, because all this stuff is starting to push all this demand and all the rent and rents are still going up. They still went up about 3% last year. So it's still going higher. We still have rates that are artificially low. So a lot of this stuff is still lending for people to build. And you'll see in your market, one of the markets that we, we live next to is Nashville. Nashville is so overbuilt right now that, you know, once you see a, a landlords giving concessions, free month, free microwave, you know, uh, f- you know, no, no, no security deposit. Once you start seeing that, you start seeing the competition, you know, you're getting over in, into an overbuilt market. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's just another reason that buying actuals don't overpay for something because you <clears> don't <throat> want to get burned at the end of the day. So just right. make sure you buy on actuals. <laughs> Um, here's another question we like to ask. How many construction permits have, have been issued? Gina, why do you like this question so much? Well, you just want to see into the future. It's just like the announcements. If you see construction permits are going up, that means there's activity. That means there's action. Now, you want to be specific. Is it single-family homes? Is it multi? Is it apartments? Is it commercial? It's just giving an idea of what's going on in the market, the, You know, the viability of construction, of business. You want to see what's going on. You can go to the town hall, the, I mean, uh, the county building, and, and, and get that number pretty easily. So that's just something that we like to look at to see what's going on with the health of the market. Here's a great one. Are properties listed on the MLS or is it a broker-driven market? Why do you love this question? 
Well, at first, when we first started, I just thought brokers put it on, throw so it on MLS, that. throw it on LoopNet, <laughs> throw it on CoStar, throw it on CarSea. I didn't you know, know about the we, underground you know, society. <laughs> You know, little did we know that these brokers, you know, and, and there's a reason why they have a hundred unit property. They want to put it on there. They don't want to waste their time, get all these phone calls. They want to have qualified buyers. So what is Jake and I? Jake and I are qualified buyers. They were on their buyers list. So in the Northeast, and it seems like in Cleveland also, um, where I'm going, I asked the question, it's all MLS driven. There's really little pocket listings. They get the listing, they put it on, and they just don't don't deal with, with buyer with buyer lists. Down in the South, where we are, it tends to be more of a broker driven market. Now that's great in one aspect because if you've got the contacts like we have, we have a couple of good brokers down there, it's awesome for you. But if you're starting out like Jake and I did in the beginning, we were just picking on the loop net. What happens is all the deals that don't work out, they end up getting them on LoopNet six months later. So they've already been looked at. So, um, I mean, it all depends how, how the market works. I like a mixture of both. I like to see some deals on the market. And I also like to see some deals held by brokers. That's why you got to get out there and you got to start making contacts with all these brokers. Yep, yep. And it's one of those things where if you don't know the brokers and you're not on their list, you're not going to be privy to those deals. And it's just, that's why you got to get out there and meet as many brokers as you can, have a great pitch book and, and really get out there and, and kick down some doors. Um, great question for a broker. How many listings do you currently have? Th this is going to show, is this a listing broker? Is he out there? Is, does, is he getting the deals? Does he have deals to bring to you? If he says, I don't have any listings, but I can show you some, maybe not your guy, right? You know, you still use them, and, and it seems like a really general question, like, oh, yeah, you, you would think of asking that question, but most people don't think of asking that question. You want to do business with somebody who's the 80-20, who's got, you know, who's doing 20% of the listings. He has 80% of the market. You want that kind of guy who's really motivated, who knows, and, you know, on, obviously, if he's listing, he's getting deals all the time. So maybe before he even gets a deal to list, he's going to call you up and say, Jake, I got this 50 unit. You know, this is what the numbers look like. Before he even puts it on and gives it to competition, he's giving it to you. So that's why it's important to find out who's listing properties and how many properties he's listed. And I think the next question is how many properties has he sold? Right. So that's even a yes. better indicator. That means he's getting the job done. How many of you sold? Wow, he's closed on three or four deals in, in the last year. And, you know, obviously how big have the deals been, you know, what the price points were. And so for you to ask all these questions, it gives you and it shows him that you know what you're talking about. So it's important to find out who's, who are the makers in the market. I have, to, I have to call a quick time out right now because one of the things that happens in the beginning is that there's a lack of credibility on the newbie side. If you're a new investor, the brokers may and may they may or may not, but they may treat you like shit. Bottom line, they may have a arrogant attitude towards you. They may, you know, not really give you the time of day. And this is an opportunity for you to turn it around on them because this is your chance to say, well, you know, if you're so high and mighty, you're the best broker in town. How many listings do you currently have? Oh, you, you have one? That's it? You only have one multifamily? Oh, well, how many have you sold in the last year? Oh, mm -hmm. you haven't sold any. But and then this is going to give you the chance to show you're you're educated. You know what you're talking about, and you can start to shift that credibility back on them. So they you're they're going to take you more seriously, and you're gonna you're gonna have more credibility, and you, you know what you're talking about. So I just it's one of those little things that really bothered me in the beginning, and so I just want to I want to bring that to light for everybody. So give give everyone the opportunity and the chance that I didn't have. But so. Jake and I also learned. And we met a broker when we first started. I don't want to give give the person's name, but this person had 20 listings, and it was the funniest thing in the world. She had so many listings, so I thought she was an active broker. I, maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. But you know, just because they have a lot of listings doesn't mean that they're really active. It just means that they've gone out, solicited your great salesman. You have to know also how many they closed those deals, or how you know that that's important number two. Or they're so or they're promising the quantity. world and giving you know listing things way too high. That's, That's other, right. Yeah. It's, it's it's quantity and quality. So, um, and you know, guys, with all these questions, you're showing your credibility. Even if you don't have any deals, the fact that you're asking all these questions and you're getting all this information is going to help you tremendously with you know building rapport with that broker. Because that broker, you know, someone asked me on Bigger Pockets, they said, "How much you have to pay the broker?" This is a broker's job. Broker's job is to get these phone calls. He wants these guys want you to call them and engage because they make money when they sell deals. So how are they going to sell deals if they don't have buyers? You're a buyer. You're out there asking these questions. You want these questions answered. He's going to answer these questions. And with all these questions, you sound so credible. You're you're you're, vi you're a viable candidate for him. So you know what? 
you're going to see that these questions take 20 to 25 minutes tops once you've got them down. And you give them a call on the phone. Don't hear to see you. Just start writing down all your answers. And you know by the time 20 minutes is up, you're all done with it. And here, here's the other thing, too. You can, you can write these out. And maybe go look at a property, and while you're walking the property, bring a notebook with you, and and you know, ask a question or two here and there, so you're not just hammering the person. And then you know, by the end of the the, the tour, you're gonna have your questions answered. And and the great thing, Jake, I think you want to do that, but I would do that with a couple of brokers. I would even probably ask a property manager also. Definitely. So I'm meeting a broker in the morning. We're gonna go out for three or four hours, then go to lunch, and after lunch, we're gonna go with another broker. Uh, for the next three or four hours. We've got a property schedule in the morning and a pr- couple of properties scheduled in the afternoon. So I want to get perspective. And, you know, we're going out with multifamily brokers. I don't know if we stress this enough. You don't want a residential broker who's going to tell you, wow, the view is beautiful. I don't could care less about the view. Second I could care less about the pool. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, you know, I mean, the hey, view. the view is beautiful. <laughs> but you want a multifamily broker. You want somebody who's going to talk NOI and talk about the numbers. So just keep that in mind. On our second deal, uh, we had a, a broker that was standing on the second floor uh, looking out at some trees and was, was trying to get me all romantic about it. Look at how pretty this is. And I'm like, do the numbers work? And I actually got kind of pissed off and just walked away at that point. But All right, n- next question. What is the typical size of a deal in your market or what, what size deals do you list? Be- and, and this may seem a little little strange, but there's actually brokers in our market that list the big stuff. That's what they do. If, if it's 100 units or more or a couple million bucks, they're going to list it. If it's smaller than that, they're probably not messing around with it. On the other hand, there's a group of brokers in town that list all the small stuff, four units, 20 units, 25 units. And they actually, um, I, I think they overprice most of their stuff personally, but there are you know different brokers for different sizes of properties. And, and I think this is very smart and specific to ask because you're going to want to find the broker that fits the size of the property that you're looking for. They may they may list both, so don't you know cl- you know single them out and, and not work with them. But you may want to go to the broker that has the bulk of the listings of the twenty unit properties if that's where you're starting. I, I think this speaks more to your um, a person's investment goals, exit strategies. Do you want to own a thousand units like Jake does by the end of the year? Well, you're not going to do that if the market doesn't have 100, 200, 80, 300 unit assets. It's not going to happen. So if that's your goal going into it, dude. Don't waste your time. Then don't even look at that market. I mean, you have to have goals set in place. If you're looking to get those 15, 20 units, and the reason why they're so high in price relative to the larger ones is because everyone's fighting over those smaller properties. They're easier to get into. And unfortunately, where all the competition and demand is, elevates the prices. And you might think I'm crazy, but I've known this firsthand. I felt this firsthand. So there's a couple of reasons why you want to ask if there's large assets. You want large assets because you want to start small like we did and go big. And you know what? We're going back small again. We're looking at 30 units. There's nothing wrong with the size. If the deal is awesome, you can buy it right, cash out, refinance, pull that money out. It's it's like a fr- it's like a freebie basically. You've got an asset. So don't look at the size, don't discriminate on the size. I would always like to go larger if I can, but if there's no, you know, if you're still looking and there's nothing there, go small if you have to. Who are the major employers in the area, Mr. Broker? Now, this could be something that you may be able to find on your own and just add it yep. to your uh, add it to your list. But they, you know, again, they may know someone that's coming into town, someone that's expanding or someone that has auxiliary offices that, that you may not know about. It never hurts to ask. Um, and, and another, to, to get even more specific, uh, if you're looking at a, an apartment complex, you can say, who's the major employer of the people that live here? And you may think that's a bizarre question, but we have apartment complexes that are 50% uh, 50% of the people work at a factory uh, that's down the road. And we love that. It, it makes us a little vulnerable because we have so many people working there. But this company screens their people so well that once we get one of these people from this manufacturing plant, we know they're a home run every time. And, and we've never had any issues with them. We still do our proper background checks and everything. But it's just we love these people coming in because we know they're, they're all stars. And Jake makes a great point. You, you want to look at employers that – are creating good jobs. You know, Jake can list off the top three or four employers. Hey, we love universities. We love hospitals. You know, we love franchises. We love healthcare. We love insurance. It, manufacturing's awesome. So look not only at the employers, but the quality of the jobs that they have. Are there any barriers to entry, Mr. Broker? What do you mean by that one, Gino? 
Well, barriers to entry, uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, in Nevada, Las Vegas, the barrier to entry is there's desert on one side, uh, uh, the lake on the other side. So there's really nowhere for, for it to expand. So basically that, you know, that, that land is much more valuable. You look in a city like Boston, the harbor's there. It's nowhere for someone to build out. So whenever you see a barrier to entry, it might be like New York City. You're, you're building in New York City. A barrier to entry there is it costs so freaking much to do business there, to get permits, the time, the union, I mean, to park, whatever. That, to me, that's a barrier to entry. Anything that's going to restrict somebody like me and Jake to go into a market and to do normal business is a barrier to entry. You can think of countless ones, whether it's government regulations, whether it's a little bit of land, whether it's you know excessive fees, excessive taxes. I would even think of taxes as being a barrier to entry because a lot of people don't want to go live in live in a in a market with those with those uh, high uh, you know um, taxes. On the flip side of this, if you're able to find an area and you're able to find a deal that has barriers to entry, you may be insulating mm -hmm. yourself. So just keep that yeah. in mind. We're not necessarily saying they're always a bad thing. No, just, they're not bad. No, no, no. Yes. Just be aware. Yes, and actually, look at Portland, Oregon. If you're in that market, the barrier to entry is not really that much. You really can't grow there. The rents are going at they're like 10% rent growth You know, year over year. There's not much. You can't build that much there. But at the same time, if you own there, your stuff is worth so much more. Your rents are going up so much more. So I don't mean it as a negative, but you always have to calculate You know, what's going to cost to get in and is it worth getting in. Who is currently investing in the market? That might like seem like a, a weird question, Jake, but I got this question from the broker in Cleveland because he told me in that market, guys from California, New York, and Florida were investing. Now, why? Because they see twenty-five to $30,000 per unit costs. And like, wow, this is a home run. Little do they know that they're really worth 10000 but to a New Yorker or California, when he's paying such a low unit cost, it's great. Problem with that is increased competition. These guys are coming in. They're usually coming with all cash. They're making higher offers. So you have to be wary of who's investing in the market. Are you going to meet LeBron when you go? Uh, I don't think he wants to meet you me. So you not eating pizza with you? <laughs> okay. No. All right. I, I like this question. Where are the B and C properties located? Show me my bread and butter, baby. <laughs> well, this is a, this is a Jake and Gino question because I don't, you know, I mean, it's specific. If you like investing in A assets, you ask where the A's are. But we like the B's and the C's. Specifically, we're transitioning more towards B's. If you can find them, the cap rates are lower. But we like the B's because, you know, you have a mixture of A and B tenants. And sometimes C tenants can sneak up into a B maybe if rents are, but if they're not. But they're a little bit more, they're a little bit more stable. They're a little bit newer. Um, you know, the, the cash flow, I think, is a little bit better. The ability for them to appreciate is a little bit better. So find out the pockets where these assets are located. I can tell you, for instance, in, in Jacksonville, the west side is the D part. C minus D part. The south, uh, where the beaches are, is the A and the B part. Um, so you have to really know the market. There's so many submarkets there. So you really have to know each submarket and locate where those assets are in, in each, in each submarket. I think, Gino, you need to find me a new broker. Because I feel like we know everybody, and there's no one new in the market yet. And I want to ask these questions to somebody. <laughs> this is good uh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know what? I mean, I'm going to go to I, Jacksonville with you and just start asking people these questions. <laughs> you'll learn it. You'll learn it. It's and you know great. what? You'd be surprised. If you don't get a really good broker, he might not know answers to a lot of these questions. So, hey, that's a ding, ding, ding. This guy's not the right broker, right? And you Unless know he's got Make a sure deal. You... Unless he's been you know, lucky enough to stumble <laughs> into a deal, he's the right broker, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Okay. All right. Can you identify the path of progress in your market? Gina, what are you, what are you trying to gain from asking this question? Well, I want you to talk about this, but real quick, what I want to say about it is the path of progress. Let's put it this way. Down in Harlem, 10, 15 years ago, you had brownstones. There are cracked dwellings. All of a sudden, gentrification, people come in, money comes in. There's a path of progress or path of growth towards these assets. All of a sudden, something that was worth $300,000, now you can't buy for $2 million. If you can identify where the city is growing outward, that is huge for you. All of a sudden, they're putting on a highway ramp. More traffic is going to go there. All of a sudden, they're putting in a new sports stadium. All of a sudden, they're putting in a new mall. The path of progress is going towards there. If you can identify that before it actually goes there, maybe you want to buy – land you want a land bank hold some land maybe you want to buy some on un, un, you know undervalued multifamily assets if you know it's growing that way bam you've got a home run there yep and there's there's a couple pockets in our market and i'm gonna i'm gonna keep those close I'm not gonna not gonna share those for free <laughs> over this call because uh, that, that's close to my heart but there's a few places and we've invested in a few of them and um and it's it's 
we bought on actuals. They're doing well today. We feel good about them now. Uh, but I think in a few years, we're going to feel really good about them. And I think we're going to start seeing some sweet, sweet growth uh, when, when, the, when the, the plans that have been put into place really start taking hold. So we're buying on actuals now. We're feeling warm and fuzzy about it. And yep. we're going to be feeling hot <laughs> in a couple sweet of years. Sweet hot, bro. You have to buy any actuals. Yep. Don't forget that. Don't pay more just because there is a path of progress happening. You don't want to pay more. If Icing you can on pay- the cake actually going on exactly yeah because you don't want to take that risk because let's say the path of progress craps out all of a sudden somebody pulls jobs and and you know you don't want to take that risk to me this is the (laughs) difference between buying for cash flow and speculating and we buy for cash flow bottom line that's right what is the per unit cost of the average apartment in this area so you're in a you're in a sub market you're in you're in a specific market i want to know B, C apartments. What is the average cost per unit? Now, look, it's going to fluctuate, but uh, I think that a good broker is going to be able to tell you. I think, you know, what I see in this market is that C plus apartments are trading for 40000 a door. Is that fair, Gino? Do you think? I mean, I think they should know a ballpark for you. I think the first thing is they should tell you a one bedroom, one bath is trading Even for 22000 a door. Yep. Two bedroom, one bath is. 28 two bedroom two bath 32 two bedroom two bath townhome so they should be able to specify all the different i mean like there's not really if you just want to get a general idea ask them what a one two and three goes for but then you have to compare apples to apples that's why i use the property class a b property two bedroom one bath more or less has got is about the same thing that's why a C property two bedroom one bath and i already identified cleveland's between 25 and 30 a door for a c property so that's something where i know if i see a property comes up at 21 a door Either there's something really wrong with the property or maybe it's a value play there. So that's just a general number that you just have to find that number out. What are the typical per unit expenses to operate a property? And this is going to go hand in hand because at the end of the day, it comes down to income versus expenses. So on the first one, we're finding finding the plus side here. We're seeing the negative, right? Well, this is crucial. I'm telling a lot of students now, this, this is like one of the most important things. You have to know what it costs to run a property. And you know what, when you're first starting out, that's gonna be difficult. That's how you get into your broker and you go down your sheet. You will find out what pest control is, you find out what garbage is, you find out what utilities are, you find out what landscaping is, you find out what labor costs, what management fees are, you find out all these expenses, supplies, miscellaneous, you try to break them down, all these expenses. So then what you do is you try to get a per unit door. And if you can't do that in the very beginning, just take 50%. It's, this rule of thumb is normally 50% of expenses. So if you're doing 10 grand a month, it's safe to say you're gonna have at least 5,000 in expenses. Then what Jake and I do is we, we figured out it's between 3,600 to $4,000 per unit. Now, if we see a guy's running a property for $4,300 per unit, we're like ding, ding, ding. That's a value play right there because he's running it at $300 more than what we would. Just by cutting those $300 a month in expenses and you got 100 units, you're cutting down $30,000 per month in expenses, $36,000 per year at a 10 cap, you just inclu- you increased your value by $360,000 in, in value at a 10 cap just by cutting $3,000 a month in expenses. So that's a huge value play. And then once you have that, you don't plug your number in. You see what they're doing with expenses and you buy down their actual expenses. So then you know if you can save money, that's that's you're buying on actuals. That's awesome. Now, if you see that they're only doing 32%, you're like, guys, there's something wrong here. Let me see your tax return, what your actual numbers are. And if they don't want to show you, you just plug in the 50% number. because And you know what? If you have experience like we do, we plug in our numbers. And if the broker knows you have credibility, the bro- brokers know if somebody He's running a property really skimpy. You can just take a look outside and see a deferred maintenance. You can see the management stinks. You can see a lot of things going on when the property is not being run well. But the reason why I'm spending so much time on expenses is it's really important. I've learned one thing about expenses. Expenses drive your business because every dollar you save in expenses, that's a dollar in your pocket. It's not the same as revenue. If you increase revenue by a buck, you've got incurred expenses, whether it's management fees, more labor, more stuff. But if you can save a buck in expenses, bro, it's a buck in your pocket and that's power. Ding, 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 ding. I got a Jake and Gino quick tip. You ready? Yeah, talk to me, bro. We're talking about brokers right now. We're talking about real estate brokers for multifamily. A great resource, a great resource to find out typical per unit expenses, mortgage brokers. 
These guys do yeah. underwriting all the time. Okay, and you want to you want to find somebody. You find a good mortgage broker that that is really worth their weight. They're going to know the answer to this question. So, for what it's worth, yes. you're getting into it. Talk to your mortgage broker about this one because they may know more than. I love you. that. Yep. I love that. You know why? We refinanced our third property, and we were running this property lean and mean. Mortgage broker came back. Properties should be running at this number. Six months later, we were running at that number. I'm like, dude, guy nailed it. You know what I'm saying? And I thought he was, I thought he was overestimating. I'm like, he really nailed that number. So you're, that's a great point. You made a great point there. What is the vacancy rate in the market? Now, this is this is a, a fantastic question because from five to ten minutes away, you might see a shift. <clears throat> you know, we got a we got a, a sub market in uh, in in our area called Oak Ridge, and that market's just getting slaughtered. I mean, everywhere else in the country is like 96% occupied. 95.7%, bro, that's right. This thing thing is like running between 80 and 85% is for a market. Yes. And and man, you better better, be well aware of the different markets, sub-markets, and and areas because you might be 10 minutes down the road and and every place 10 minutes down the road is looking at 98% occupancy. When you get into Oak Ridge, that drops off. So you gotta be, you gotta really, really keep an eye out for that because that's, that's the, that's a huge difference right there. So you gotta buy an actuals at eighty percent, and if you think you're a rock star, you buy it eighty percent and bump it up by twenty. That's what Jake and I did with our third property. We bought this thing at eighty percent. It had like thirty vacancies. Now it wasn't because of the property. See, that's what you have to differentiate. Was it because of the, the market, or, or was market? it because of the property? Right. So this was not because of the market. They had four thousand jobs two tenths of a mile away from them. They were just, their screening was horrible and they were mom and pops who just didn't want to do it anymore. They were under rented and there was so much vacancy. So we bought an actual, so when you buy with $53,000 in rental income and all of a sudden a year and a half later, you're at almost 90, you can see the power in buying an actual and understanding the market dynamics. We knew there were tons of jobs. We knew that their, that their applications were just, you, you can't, you know, expect people with 700 credit scores to go into a, to a, a C class property. We fixed all those. So know why there's the vacancy. Why the, what's going on? Is it because there's so much being supply being overbuilt and people are leaving? Is it because jobs are migrating out of the market? You have to know why the vacancy is there. And if there's something you can fix, if it's with the manager of the property or because the property's got a lot of deferred maintenance, fix it. Buy it and take care of that that vacancy, and you'll make a ton of money that way. Next up, what is the rent growth over the past three years? What are you seeing for rent increases uh, in in the specific market over the past three years? Well, that's important only because you're going to see what's going on. I mean, some of these markets are being so they're being so uh, the un- they're becoming so unaffordable. You look at San Francisco, you look at Portland, you look at Washington, you look at New York City. Some of these markets are getting to be so expensive that. I mean, it's just it's out of control. You, it's it's hard to buy there. So, um, you know, typically, I mean, you know, over the last 30, 40 years, it was rate of inflation, Jake, right? It's around between two and three percent. The last three or four years, because of you know shortages of housing, people wanting to rent, it's been it's been around five percent. So, um, you like to see that it's healthy. It's healthy for you. So, when you're buying on actuals and you're getting that five percent rent bump every year, three percent, that's insulating you from inflation and it's just keeping you in line with your expenses. Uh, going up in value. I think there's so many on this next question. I think there's so much uh, to discuss, um, not only for the the asset part of it, but also for the refi part. Next question that we want to find out is what are the cap rates for a specific asset class in the market? And the reason that this also applies to the refi end of it is that we um, have been buying things on 8% cap rates consistently and i know people are like oh no that's bs and you know we've heard it but check our underwriting that's all i can say but what it comes down to though is that when we're going to because we're buying hold we're not selling when we go to refi some of these properties um we have been fortunate enough to see some of uh the appraisals come back in at sub eight percent cap rates and so what that does is if we can get the noi up and get a a better cap rate when uh, our properties are being appraised that's a that's a ding 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 and we're gonna see a nice little cash out there um and you know uh, just to uh just to speak on this uh, next wednesday you know a week from now we're actually cashing out 
um, over one point five million dollars, and it's it was a specific or it was the exact scenario that that I just uh, discussed. So that's one thing. If you're gonna buy and hold, and and you're gonna you know get the NOI up and refi these things. Make sure that that's what you're looking for, and and when you're getting the the refi appraisal, you're really trying to find out what that cap rate is that the uh, the appraiser is going to be using because it could really really help you out. What Jake's referring to is he's referring to jet fuel or Ooh, what I like to call it, an emerging an emerging market. We got a little fortunate. Um, a lot of guys talk about this. Everyone says you're crazy. Why are you buying that? What are you doing with that? You know what? We might have been crazy, but you know luck goes to people who work hard and take chances. So I want you guys all out there to be lucky. That means you're working hard and you're taking chances. And that's what happened with us on this deal that Jake was talking about. It was a big deal. I mean, we split up into two different assets. It was bought for four million. We did tons of work on this. They needed a lot of management, had a lot of deferred maintenance, but the thing is, it was only a 12-month time frame. That was the amazing thing about it. Now, we're buying it as cap rates are compressing. We're buying it at above what the cap rate is. We're buying it an eight cap when the caps are seven. Now, how are you doing this? Well, it's a property where there's people that don't want to buy it. Mom, Mom and, and pops, pops can't baby. buy it. It's too big. And the REITs don't want it. So it's, you know, 136 units. It's in our sweet spot. Um, we got the operations up fantastically. We, Jake did a great job. The management team did a great job doing that. So that's the managed part of it. Now the finance part comes in. Once you do that, once you're in a, in, in, a, in a stable market that has all the tenants we need, you can keep the vacancy up, you're getting the rents up, and you're doing all that, that's what you end up with. I like it. Uh, it's also going to help you with your underwriting. You know, if, if you know what you should be looking for and, and you try to, you know, get a little aggressive with it, it's going to just, it's going to give you more accurate underwriting, I think, uh, when it comes down to it. Um, next up is, is the market cash flowing, uh, or poised for capital appreciation? What do you, what are you looking for here, Gino? Well, Jake, I mean, I, I think everyone should stress, should, sh you know, stress cash flow. That's the first thing yes. you should look at. But I mean, I think you want a little bit of both. There's certain markets that, like I said, I, I'll mention Rochester again, what I asked for $40,000, 10 years later, it's worth $40,500. What's great about Sweet. it 10 years later yeah, you've paid down principal. Your tenants paid down, so you've got that principal, that amortization. You've cash flowed. The house is ten years older. That's the problem. These houses are already old, so you got to put money back into it. But I mean, um, that's a market. You just have to understand what your strategy is. If you're looking to appreciate, you're not going to Rochester. Now, other markets like San Francisco, you're not going to cash flow there. But if you're there buying for six hundred grand, and two years later it might be worth eight hundred grand, that's an appreciation. So you know what your strategy is, and figure out what type of market uh, your strategy will work in. And uh, what do Jake and Gino do? They force the appreciation, baby. We're not worried about yes. it because we are going to drive <laughs> NOI all day with a sledgehammer. So, you know, it's it's good to know because it, it, Gino's making a point where if you if you're on, you know, you're in New York or you're in Chicago, you're in San Francisco, people are buying for appreciation. They're saying, I'm going to buy this cheap, and then, you know, six months from now it's going to be worth double, right? And and that's that's what they do. They're not cash flowing. We cash flow and we drive appreciation through driving NOI. So it's all based on the income and it's not speculation. Let me give everybody a little lesson. Back in 07, 08, everyone was going through the greater fool's theory. I'm going to buy it for X and some fool is going to buy it for Y. It works great. And when you when people see that going on, they don't understand that the smart guys are out and the fools like happen to me get caught holding the bag. You learn that deal once. If you're lucky to survive it, you'll never want to do that again. And that's what's going on in a lot of these markets. I mean, uh, condos and uh, one, one bedrooms in Manhattan are going for a million bucks. There's no way people cash flow. There's no way. They're just, they're just holding them. It's like a stock. Why be in real estate when you can be in stocks? Buy Apple for 100 bucks. hope it goes to 110 push your button, you're out. Real estate, it's too much risk involved with that because if you, you know, people if you say, well, you know what, I'll hold it forever. That's not the point. You can hold the property for 10 years. If you buy that property wrong, you're stuck with that property. And, you know, I'll talk to people back in 08. They're still holding the bag in a lot of those deals. And if you can avoid that, try to avoid that because you do not want to buy just for capital appreciation. Sooner or later, somebody's going to get hold, caught holding the bag depending on what, what part of the um, investment cycle you're at. What is the average age of the multifamily properties in this market? That's, a, that's an interesting one. What are you looking for there? You know, 
uh, uh, let me talk about Rochester again. Uh, problem with Rochester in the Midwest, a lot of these assets are 100 years and older, these duplexes. So what does that mean? When you buy them, you have to put enough capital expenditure money aside to know you know the roofs are probably going. A lot of old siding is going. right? That's right. The boilers are going. The flooring is old. And, you know, that stuff has to get taken care of. And in a $40,000 house, it's a duplex. Numbers look awesome, bro. One person goes out, the roof goes, your CapEx is blown for the next three years, right? Driveway gets get taken care of. So, you know, know the age of the assets. I don't mind if something's 30 or 40 years old. It's called functional obsolescence, something that's really old all of a sudden doesn't work in this day and age. It costs a lot of money to upgrade that asset. So be, be, beware of what's going on with that. So um, in the market of Jacksonville, I know a lot of the assets are 30, 40, 50 years old, and they're considered Bs because they just don't have any newer assets. So, you know, usually the age of the asset less than 30 years is usually a B. Anything older is a C, but certain markets don't have newer assets. So um, we tend to like to buy stuff, you know, within the last 30, 40 years because it's all pretty new. The systems are pretty much new. The air conditioning have been replaced already once. On Roofs are usually roof or touched up. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what you know. That's just be wary of how old the assets are, and just take into consideration when you're looking at a property what capital expenditures you need. Look at the hot water heaters. Look at the air conditioners. Look at the roofs. Look at the driveways. Look at the um, the appliances. Look at all that stuff. Take take into consideration the age of it. Take into consideration the age of the flooring, the the kitchen cabinets, all like that's all stuff's got to get get replaced. The farther away you can push it off, the better it is. So just take into consideration all those ages. This is this is next one's really interesting because we don't operate in any market that does not. Um, but the question is, does the market employ rubs or ratio utility billing systems? And and basically what Gino's getting at there is, can you bill the folks back for their their water usage? And this is big for for us because it's a it's the second pillar of our our repositioning strategy. Where you know initially we're going to fill the vacant units at market, but once we're done with that, we're going in and. Uh, and we're getting the rubs going quick because it's a huge revenue generator. So I think this is something you got to find out right away, don't you, Gino? I think some parts of Cleveland do it and some parts don't. I mean, really? I think, so you, you're saying it, it's 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 uh, segmented by the market? Uh, it's segmented or, by or, oh yeah, definitely. But it's legal by, throughout by throughout part. throughout the state, though, correct? You can do it anywhere. It's just um, certain um, areas are doing it and some are not. Yeah, well, certain areas don't do it. So if you're a landlord who's trying to do it. You're out of luck. Certain Maybe. C certain C assets in Cleveland won't do that, but certain Bs will do that. Certain parts of the city, the east side might not do that, but the west side does do that. Up here in New York, when I bought when I bought the three family, I like to tell this story all the time. I bought the three family and my dad is in the car, tenant leaves a light on on the porch. And my dad in his Italian voice goes, not guess he's not paying for the rent. We had one meter, Jake. So guess who's paying the rent? Gino. So, you know. After hearing this for three months, I said, Dad, I, I got to you know, figure something out here because I'm, I'm going nuts with this voice in my ear. So what I ended <laughs> up doing was I ended up splitting the meters. It cost me $6,000 to do that because I had to put in a whole meter bank, and New York is expensive. But what I ended up doing, I ended up recouping that money, I think, I don't know, maybe after two years because all the meters, all the – People started paying their own utilities. So you talk about at least 100 bucks a month for four units. That's 500 bucks, you know, uh, a, a month that got pushed off to them. But I'm sure when they start paying it, they paying a lot less because they're paying it out of their pocket. That's why I love rubs, guys, because they start paying their water usage. No one's filling up their pools. No one's doing car washes because they end up seeing that the money's coming out of their pocket. That's why I love to employ rubs. Oh, I love it. What are the current rents for various unit mixes? One beds, two beds, three beds, studios. Uh, I think this is this is is pretty much a uh, a no brainer, but it's a, it's a very important part of the equation. What you say? This is the other part. The yeah. Income expenses. You have to know what a two bedroom, one bath townhome is going to get in that market because if you're looking at and you see all of a sudden a 30 unit came up it's all two beds ones and it, the the they're getting 525, but you know the market rate is 600. That's what's something you got to jump on right away. So you have to know what what market rents are, and it's very easy. Apartments.com, Rentometer.com. You can go on various websites. You can just Google the property address and look around what everyone else is charging. There's so many different places to find this this information, but you have to find it and you have to learn exactly what rents are going for in your market. I'm gonna lump these next two together because it's it's they're 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 going along the same lines and. If you're not going to self-manage, you're going to need to hire a management company. So it's very important to get referrals from your broker. And I think one of the things you really need to ask for is what management company do you recommend 
and talk to me about the typical fees for my market. Or is it 10% to manage? Is it 5%? What are the fees and who do you recommend? And this is this is where you're going to start team building, right, Gino? Um, it is the bane of every real estate investor's existence, <laughs> management. Sid Jake's laugh and management companies. They're very hard to find. So when you find one who's reputable, um, you have to just – you know, latch on to them, pay them what they deserve because it's a hard job to make money on. So, um, you know, get a couple of referrals. Brokers, I got a referral from one. I'm going to meet them down there when we get down there. I want to talk to them. I want to see what their portfolio is, see if, they, if they're managing. You don't want a residential bro, uh, poor pro- property manager. You want a multifamily property manager who has a substantial you know, amount of assets under under their belt that they can devote more guys to you. And don't get somebody who's got 10 units and you have a 50 unit property because they're not ready for you. You know what I'm saying? You want somebody who's got a decent number of assets where they can allocate another worker to your place. So make sure you get somebody who's a good fit for you. These next two are crucial as well, and they, they're following along the same lines. And that's, can you recommend an insurance company or broker? And can you recommend a mortgage broker or bank? This is going to be your professional team. These are the folks you're going to interact with on a weekly basis. At least we do, you know, depending on how, how involved you are in your business. But, you know, as, as you're growing, you're going to be working with these folks on a regular basis. So, one, you want to find people that you like, that are competent, and that are, you're going to get a good price with. I think those are the three things you really need to look for in each of these folks. And if the broker is has been in the game, if he's a real multifamily broker, if he's owned assets, he should have a handful of folks that he can re- uh, recommend on, for each one of these. Jake, the other reason is you want these guys is they're going to bring you deals. The insurance broker is in the business. The mortgage yeah. broker is in the business. They know what's selling. So if they know you're a mom-and-pop investor who likes to buy 70 units in a B-plus market at a 7 cap and they see these deals coming wrong, who are they going to call? They're going to call you because they know you're going to get the deal done. And plus, they're going to get the commission or the insurance broker is going to get the uh, – he's going to get the insurance on the deal. So that's another vital aspect. And um, you know, the insurance broker is really important. You really have to find somebody who's in multifamily and who knows exactly how to underwrite these deals. And when you're looking at properties, that's how you can get people. If you're buying, if you're buying a property, find out who the insurance broker is. Get the deck page, declaration page. See what they're doing and compare apples to apples. Let him give you a quote and go out and get another two quotes from two more insurance brokers so you just walked around a 30 unit apartment complex you've completely worn this broker out with questions you've asked him about the carpet you've asked him about the tenants you've asked him the age of the roofs on the property you asked him if they're doing rubs you asked him 20 other questions about the property and now you're, you're going to show them that you're a closer what other deals do you have for me to analyze? I'm hungry. I want to get in the game. Show me what you got, baby. Give me some mo. Give me some mo. Give me some mo. Right. And the thing is, he's going to give you less. He's going to give you less. He's going to give you less because <laughs> he ain't going to give you a good deal in the beginning. He wants to see if you're a serious player. He's going to give yep. you crappy deals. So you hold your ground. You get Analyze right back him. to him. He's going to send you a deal tomorrow. Yep. Tomorrow night, you better go back to him and say, "I'm sorry, John." I buy in 10% cash on cash. This thing's only doing 2% for me. You know, listen, I, I'm buying B minus C properties. This is a this is a D this is a D area. Um, no path of progress here at all. Cap rate is just really minuscule. Tell him why. He'll want to know why. He's testing you to see if you know what you're doing. So make sure you get back to him right away. Right away. Do as you're saying and say as you do. And let him keep sending you the deal. Say, John, that was great. I'm glad you sent me one. Just, you know what? If you get another one across the desk, just send it over to me. I'd love to analyze it. This is awesome, man. If I would have had this when we first started investing, this would have probably cut off three months uh, of our investment time right there. That's right. The learning curve. That's the right. The learning curve, baby. Hey, listen. I'm Jake. He's Gino. We bring the pain. Hit us up. You know, we, we want to hear from you. Go to our website, jakeandgino.com. Uh, we have a calendar at the bottom. We, we're doing Friday uh, strategy sessions. So, guys, half-hour free strategy sessions if you guys want to do it. Um, in addition to that, don't forget iTunes. If you guys are finding value in this, please leave us a great review on iTunes. And the G-Daddy has one more thing to say to you. Gino, what's going on? Guys, last but not least, the Italian in me, don't forget where you, we're going to go eat for lunch. That's the most <laughs> important question. Where is a great place to eat lunch? And guys, pull out the wallet, buy lunch. It'll be a great time. You guys will have a great time. You know, that's probably one of the one of the nicer things about going to another city, experiencing the city, experiencing the vibrancy of the city, meeting people, and it, it should be a fun learning experience. And you know what? You're meeting great people. Bring the guy out to lunch. Enjoy Take it. Take the broker have a great out to lunch. Show him your pitch book. Let him know you're serious, and it's going to go a long ways, right? Yeah, I think so. Gino, over and out. Jake.
Thanks, bro. See you, See you later. Okay.